Thanks for tuning in to Stay Sharp with Razorleaf, your secret weapon for all things digital and manufacturing. When our team came up with this topic on intelligent part numbers, I can honestly say that I was a bit worried about how dry this topic might be. But I was pleasantly surprised that this discussion led by Jonathan Scott had some angles to it that I did not anticipate. John Farello does an excellent job asking all the right questions to pull out the real story around intelligent part numbering. And there really is one. If this is something you have considered doing in your organization, give it a listen before deciding as Jonathan outlines what is good and the drawbacks around these decisions. Tune in and give us some feedback and let us know if this surprised you like it did me. Let's listen in with Jonathan and Jen. Welcome back, everybody, to Stay Sharp, the podcast about all things digital related to products and manufacturing. And I do mean all things. Uh, I have to admit, when we discussed the, the topic for today, which is intelligent part numbers as our next topic, I thought, wow, this will be interesting. I no, actually, you didn't. <laughs> yes, actually, I did because I thought I have spent my entire career in 3D engineering software without ever having an intellectual discussion about numbers. I know that might seem amazing, but it, it is in fact true. Luckily, today I'm joined with my, by my colleague, Jonathan Scott. Hi, everybody who is well, very well-versed on the topic. And after a quick conversation with him, I realized that I actually did know more than I thought. I just wasn't from, as familiar with the term. After a short stint at a company that manufactures hardware, which shall remain nameless, anybody can check my LinkedIn and figure out what it might have been. <laughs> I know all about how painful creating a, a new SKU can be. Um, and now I understand why. So the numbers are something that people can get really insanely passionate about. I didn't say yes, I understood is. it. I said, we're going to discuss it. So today we're going to lean heavily into Jonathan's expertise as we get into the weeds about numbers, how much intelligence we should or should not bake into them, a little bit about the history and highlight a few of the landmines that you can run into related to part numbering if you're not watching where you step. So Indeed. <laughs> Jonathan, let's, let's start out with where we started on our first conversation, which is what's a part number? Right. I mean, to talk about intelligent part numbers, you got to talk about part numbers to start with. What are they? You know, why do we even have them? Why do we need them? That kind of thing. And I am not the right person to give the history lesson here. I actually, I heard a fascinating talk. I want to say it was by Evan Yeris at a 3D CIC years ago. And I might be mispronouncing his last name. I hope I got it right. But he did a great talk about some of the history of engineering. And it was around... Uh, manufacturing of Remington rifles years ago, but it was about, you know, how did we get into kind of modern manufacturing, modern engineering? And one of the topics they talked about was part numbers. So forgive me if I get the history wrong here, but I think that's where this idea came from is when we started to get into mass production and assembly lines, and it was no longer one artisan making a product, you know, making the one thing that they sold. Right. And it became a group of people making it. And you just made this part and then you passed it down. And then the next person made this part. And the next person made that part. You know, you had to have parts that were interchangeable and that fit with each other for that to work. And right. so you couldn't just modify them that, as you go. Right. Right. You can't just, you know, like, oh, hold that doesn't fit. Let me just shave that down. And now that'll go with that part. And, you know, they, they had to fit right and therefore be interchangeable. So to make that happen, you needed to identify a part. Say, hey, this is this thing. And this is the standard it has to meet. And, you know, back then, I think a lot of it was around, you know, templating, like, you know, hold up the new part. Does it fit? Does it look like the old part? Right. Yeah, okay, that one's good. You know, so way back when it was that kind of thing. But the idea was that was that part. There was a model for it and you had to identify it. And so people started giving it a number. They needed an identifier. And that that's the start of part numbering is to be able to uniquely identify it so you could tell it from this other part. Because, of course, there are some times that Parts look alike, they're similar, you know, there's a left hand, a right hand. So you need to be able to identify them so that you can make them to a consistent standard and that whole mass production process will work. So I think that's that's where the idea came from. That's why we need it. Well, and that makes a lot of sense, particularly when you're talking about assembly, man, you know, manufacturing and going down the line, making sure that everything fits. But, you know, outside of engineering, does anybody else care? I think so. I mean, I, I think I think they have to because of some of what we're talking about there, right? Manufacturing certainly has to care because, you know, if, if engineering tells you, look, here's the standard for how this part needs to look and this is what makes it interchangeable or not, manufacturing needs to know when they go pull it out of the bin to put it together. And similarly, anybody else involved with the, the product has to care, right? So 
purchasing. Oh, I'm going to buy those parts instead of making them or service. I'm going to go replace one of those parts. Well, you know, <laughs> every per- person who's tried to repair something at home has been <laughs> just fallen into that trap of, well, I thought I got the right part to replace or repair this thing and it wasn't the right one. Well, could you imagine how hard that would be if you had the right number? Like, I know this is the number of the part I need to replace, and the thing you got didn't look like the thing that you took out. Like, you know, so everybody cares about that being right, right? That a number really represents that one unique part. Right. Well, and I guess if if purchasing, if it matters to purchasing, then it certainly matters to sales, right? Because you have to know what you're selling to different customers. That's right. And you don't want to get anything mixed up either, right? You know, like, oh, I told you it'll do, this product's going to do this, this, and this. And, oh, actually, you got a different one. Right. Oh, <laughs> so sorry. That doesn't I work didn't mean either, that right? one. I meant this other one right. over here. Exactly. The newer one. Well, and it, and to your point, you know, services needs those. So it's it's definitely all along the line. It's not just, it's not, not just another great idea engineering came up with. That's right. Yeah, it's something I think the entire organization and people outside of an organization care about, right? Is that they can really identify all the, the components and elements of a product. So it's a, it's a lot like naming then. It's just a way of, or similar to naming it, a product anyway. I think so. I think so. It's I mean, it's a little bit different in, in the fact that for the purposes I was just talking about, you have to have uniqueness. With naming, mm, it can get interesting because, you know, English is tricky. Well, so is every other language for that matter. But there's ambiguity in language like that. So you can say, oh, it's a bracket, left, upper, blah, 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 you know, and, and that might be very descriptive and help people find it and understand a part. But it's okay if there's a bracket, left, upper in product A and in product B. And maybe you could use the context to tell people which bracket, left, upper I'm talking about. Or you might have some unique identifier, like a part number that helps you differentiate which one I'm talking about. So I think, you know, naming does something for us, and it's an important function to help you understand things in a localized context. But it's okay if if when you name something, you have to name two or three or four parts, even the same thing. You don't have to guard for that same uniqueness. But with, with part numbering, I think you do. I think you have to make sure that you don't have any duplication or, or something. There has to be some way of telling things apart for sure, definitively. I guess that, that makes sense. I mean, it's particularly if you're trying to create as much differentiation in a name as you could in a number, it's going to get really long, right? So to your point, like bracket, upper, left, product A, manufacturing, right. you know, facility B, you know, that's that's quite... Well, that, actually, that, that's a perfect lead into talking about what does the intelligent part of part numbering mean, right? You know, we're, our topic today isn't just part numbering, it's about intelligent part numbering. And that's a lot of times what people are trying to do when they create intelligent part numbers. So what do I what do I mean by intelligent, at least as I understand it? Mm-hmm. It's putting some meaning to the number, right? So far, we're talking about part numbers. They don't have to mean anything. They don't have to mean that it's a bracket or that it's made of a certain material or any of those things. They could just be numbers. And that's good enough for uniqueness. That's good enough for identifying something. Not always easy to remember, but it's good <laughs> enough for the purpose that you need. The intelligent part comes in when people are trying to make that number represent something. They're trying to make it mean, oh, well, the first two digits tell me what system it's in in my product. You know, if it's in the the power transmission system or it's in the structure or it's in the energy storage or the controls or whatever. Okay, maybe I, I put my first two digits or coding that and then there's a dash and then there's another three digits that tell me the type of component it is. Oh, is it a fastener? Is it a a custom part? Is it a power, you know, transmission part, whatever? And then the last two digits I use for this or, you know, and that's how you get these built up intelligent numbers where you're encoding something in all the sections. And, you know, not everybody does a, a fully encoded number. Sometimes it's like, you know, you do the first part. Oh, here's the manufacturing plan I make it in. And then it's a serialized number. And, and by serialized number, what I mean is just Auto generated. You take the next, the next, the next, the next, right? And that that's how you get that uh, that uniqueness, right? Is serialization is a way of saying I won't repeat the same number because I'm always counting up. So sometimes intelligent numbers are semi-intelligent. People try to put some uniqueness component in them, right? So the best of both worlds Um, or the worst of both worlds? Hey, you know, that's a great question. I mean, I think it's it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't have an answer. It's. I, I think it improves the situation for some of the things we we might talk about in a minute about how you know 
how intelligent part numbers can be tough, but it doesn't solve it. You know, maybe it's a, a not so great compromise. I don't know. So why is it important that, at least in, in your estimation, why is it important to put intelligence into part numbers? Is it the uniqueness? Is it the repeatability, the traceability? What What's important about yeah. that? Yeah. You know, I, I don't want to downplay why this matters because I've, I've you mentioned at the beginning how this can be sort of a religious argument for some folks, and it really can be. I've had this conversation with so many customers I can't count, and people are on very different sides of, of the argument, and, and one very strong argument for putting information or intelligence into your part numbers is that it helps people figure things out quickly, right? right? Folks on the manufacturing floor, folks in engineering, folks in marketing, sales, all the groups inside the company it becomes like a like a jargon or a slang that everyone understands. So if you're looking for a quick way to communicate and talk about things related to your product and, and everybody understands and shares this, this kind of simple language or slang, I know, it's pretty efficient. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great way to communicate quickly or understand things quickly. So there, there's an advantage. Now, the tough part of any kind of, you know, internal language or slang or jargon is that it's that, that group that understands it and anybody outside of it has to learn it before they can communicate. So that that's kind of tough. But, uh, you know, you needed that before we had PDM and PLM systems, right? So before we had any kind of data management system, you needed a shortcut because, you know, if you wanted to talk about parts on the shop floor or talk about, hey, can you get me that one out of inventory? You needed this way of saying, well, I know that's a bolt. I know that's a nut. I know where to look for that. Mm-hmm. because you weren't going to pull out the paper drawing every time and say, well, it's bracket left upper or it's, you know, socket head cap screw quarter 20 by one inch long. You know, the, the names and the materials, and it was a lot of information to hold on to. So it was very helpful because, you know, the human brain can hold on to only a certain amount of information. So when PDM and PLM showed up, we have this new capacity, right? We get extra memory and we don't necessarily have to put all that intelligence into just a number. Right. Although I can see where it would be helpful, though, I mean, for automation and for storing, et cetera, like, and for integrations to have something coded rather than a name, which can be much more hmm, flexible or less less standardized. Yeah, I I think that's true. I mean, you, names and things can be, can be much less standardized. And that's the beauty of them and the curse of them at the same time. And I think, you know, the other thing uh, I'll just say, just everybody's got this context in mind, is intelligent part numbers. Sometimes it's a lot more than just naming that their people were encoding, right? It's the, the function of the part, maybe the material of the part, maybe where it sits in a manufacturing process. Like I, I've been with some folks who finished parts have a certain kind of part number, but work in process parts have another kind of part number, and raw materials have another kind of part number. And it's like, okay. Well, that tells me something really interesting until I change my manufacturing process. Dang it. You know? <laughs> so, well, I was going to say, it, it sounds like there's a, an inherent cost associated with using intelligent part numbers. Not just, I mean, that there's a certain amount of time you have to invest in learning. And, you know, if you're coming into a, a company, learning their naming, their numbering conventions and what that means, learning the language, so to that's speak. Right. But there's, there's got to be other costs associated with that. What are, what are some of those? There absolutely are. And I think cost is a great point when you're talking about part numbering. It's something we always have to keep in mind. And I I remember very clearly having this conversation with a customer when they said, look, we have definitive information that tells us how much a new part number costs for us. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. Now, this was 20 some years ago, early in my career when I was having this conversation. Now, I think it's most people, you know, sort of expect that. But at the time, I think their number was $20,000 $20,000 or $25,000 per part number, that's what it costs them to just add one new part number in their entire you know, world of, of product development. And I was just dumbfounded by that. I was like, really? And they're like, yeah, think about it for a minute. We have to set up the number. It gets set up in multiple systems. We have to take the time to set it up and describe what it is and, and what material it has. And then you know, there's a drawing for it that we have to manage. And, and then we have to go create things on the logistics side, which might be a purchasing agreement for where we're going to buy it. Uh, we have to get those contracts ready. We have to um, decide how much inventory we're going to manage. And then there's the cost of carrying that inventory. Because if we need the part, we must have to have a certain quantity on hand for what it is that it's making. And oh, by the way, if we have multiple facilities, and they did, we have to have that inventory at each of the facilities that makes the parts. 
And we have to consider what do we do as we, you know, have flexible manufacturing and shift things around. So there's some planning we have to do. I'll stop. I mean, it, <laughs> it goes on and on and on, right? They had lots of things that contributed to the cost of that part number. And they said, look, just on average, that's what it looks like for us. So we have to be careful when we add new part numbers. I'm like, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. I get that. And it, the how that relates back to this conversation is we were having a discussion about whether their part numbering should be intelligent or not. And, you know, they they had arguments on both sides. They're like, well, if we encoded it, we would immediately see if we had another part that was at that plant, fit that function, was that color. Because when they went to generate the part number, the system would tell them, hey, that's not unique. Right. And so they couldn't do it. And they said, that's going to save us a ton. And I said, well, but... I mean, isn't that the same thing as if you'd gone through all those metadata fields, picked them all, and it said, hey, another one exists like that. Doesn't, isn't this independent of numbering? And that's where they landed eventually, is they were like, you're right, it is. We don't, we don't have to have that. We could just check to see if we've made this part before and then reuse it, because that's what they're really after. Right. Right. And not say, oh, well, my part numbers have to continue to be intelligent for me to have this uniqueness check. So again, it, I think... You know, it's all about thinking about what you're trying to do that helps you understand this problem. And it's easy to fall into this trap of, well, we've had intelligent part numbers. We should keep having them. Well, and it's funny because listening to you explain all of this, it really does bring back to, you know, I, I mentioned my my short stint at a company that manufactures hardware. And always having been in software, you know, software, generally speaking, doesn't have a lot of materials, doesn't have a lot of right. color, doesn't have a lot of size. And when I had to go out and generate a new SKU for a new piece of software, just jumping through all of these same hoops, you know, to Mm -hmm. create this number and how long it took and how many people I had to talk to was amazing. And it was funny because at at the end of that, my boss was like, I mean, we'll just use those for now. But I mean, if we change it, we can just, he goes, I mean, you can just do that easily. I'm like, nothing about this is easy. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. No, you are not allowed to do that. I'm sorry. That's not okay. I just sweated six weeks to do that. So no. (laughs) That's right. That's right. And you just, you mentioned a good term. You mentioned it early when we were uh, kicking off the podcast, an SKU. I think it's worth digging into that for a minute because it's, it exemplifies the thing we're talking about here. So SKU is stock keeping unit, right? And that is that represents when a product is being sold to consumers and there's some, you know, retail or distributor how do they track the number? Because an SKU for a product may or may not match your internal engineering part numbering system. Like some folks have an externally facing part number and an internally facing part number. And I'll just dive into that for a minute. I I have much less issue with intelligent externally facing part numbers, intelligent SKUs Mm -hmm. than I do with internal ones, right? Internal, yeah, it's all about you. You can control how your business operates, that kind of thing. I get it out on the market. Like I appreciate when I'm buying, you know, an iPhone or something. It's like, well, iPhone 12, right? That's the next one after 11. Okay, it makes sense, right? When people number things in a way that makes sense to me as a consumer, I'm I'm on board. So, but that point about SKUs is, that's another example of the cost of this, right? I mean, when you start talking about the end item that we're, the end item of the product, that top level number that somebody cares about when they go to sell it to the market, well, yeah, now you're talking serious dollars, right? How many does Walmart have in a warehouse? How many does Amazon have in a warehouse? How many do they keep at each store? Wow, now we're talking real money. So when you start changing part numbers on things like that, there are big implications, just like you saw in the software world. You had to talk to a lot of people because there's a lot of implications to changing those numbers. And I imagine those are not the only times that those kind of numbers change, right? So we don't live in a world where one company controls its own destiny, like and its product lines all the time. Sometimes they buy right. other companies that have their own way <laughs> of numbering things, or oh, merge with another one. company, or you know. Mm-hmm. So I've been a part of a couple of those situations with customers where, oh, we bought another company and they had a PDM or a PLM system, and we have our own. And you know, how are we going to integrate theirs? You know, can we just migrate their data into our system? Ha ha ha. <laughs> That's very funny. (laughs) One of the big challenges is about numbering. The first obvious challenge is if there's overlap between the two companies and the products that they make, you've got to sort of rationalize that. And there are marketing people who and salespeople who are probably thinking about that very early on. Like, hey, we sell one, they sell one. Which one are we going to sell going forward? That kind of thing. So that's, that's sort of the tip of the spear that needs to be thought about. But then there's the, 
okay, we both make, you know, 200 products combined total, but each of those 200 products uses like 3,000 fasteners. Hmm. You had part numbers for those fasteners. I have part numbers for those fasteners, but we're using some of the same fasteners. When we go to make them together, what are we going to do about this? And that's the, the problem of merging all that product data. Well, if you called them something different than I called them, hmm, we may have some issues here. So there are a lot of data things that you have to think about in a merger and acquisition that relate to part numbering. And I'll tell you, it, it's simpler. It can be simpler if there's no intelligence in those numbers, right? Those identifying numbers, because then you can just sort of swap out one for another, right? right? I mean, I don't care if, if my bolt is 5896354, and you tell me, well, that bolt over on our side needs to be 62559. Duh, okay, <laughs> sure. It's still a socket head cap screw, and it's still an inch long. And, you know, it doesn't really matter to people. And so you could keep the old number and cross-reference to the new number, and it's not a big deal. But if it's, oh, this is what it was, and it had a lot of meaning behind that number, and you need to change it to something else. And I'm talking either way, either the acquirer or the uh, person being acquired has the intelligent part numbering system. It's tricky, right? Because somebody's got to have different meaning than they had before things started. And then it really gets hard if they have CAD data. Because CAD data is, just as an example, there are other examples, it's not just CAD data, but when you go to change that part number, a lot of people put that in the file name. A lot of people used the, the part number that got generated on the design to say, all right, that's the file name of it. And you go changing file names on CAD, on that 3D That is a CAD, religion. It is not happy. <laughs> that is a religion. <laughs> it is not happy. It is. It is. So you could get into a real, real problem there. But, you know, to your point, Mergers and acquisitions are a place where you can see it. Anytime that you need to combine or or share part numbers, intelligent part numbering can present some some real problems. Well, and again, you're going to run into that same, you know, when I when I start talking about the the cost of learning, you know, when you come into a company and learning their intelligent numbering system. Same thing would happen with a merger or acquisition, right? It's not just changing Absolutely. the data, it's also re-educating the workforce and retraining the workforce is, no, no, no. I know you used to call it this, but now you have to that's right. apply this. I mean, that's, that's got to take a certain amount of time and effort. Oh, I think so, right? I mean, there's there's there, there's a number of things to that, but certainly the amount of time it takes to train people for them to get up to speed. And the more it's ironic, or maybe ironic is not the right word, counterintuitive, I don't know. The more time you spend the more efficient you are at using some kind of intelligent numbering system to operate internally, and the more people understand it and they're really speedy with it, the harder it is for somebody to break into that process, right? The more education, the longer the learning curve for them to come up to speed with that. So it's weird. It does create an issue there. I think another another thing I don't want to forget, when we were talking about having to renumber things in mergers and acquisitions, that problem exists even when you're talking about one at a time. It's a great example to think about that for a minute. If you need to change a part number and it's, and it's an intelligent part number, because somebody says, well, you know, it was supposed to be a, it was a structural component. So it had a, an O2 in the middle of the number, but it changed to not just a structural component, but now it's a functional component. Oh, well, that's an O8. You know, so, so so somebody changed the design. Part didn't change at all, but they changed what it's purpose function. it's serving in the, the product, yeah. right? Okay, now we need to go through all of this hassle, right, of changing the part, which means an engineering change process, which means changing the next higher assembly, which means all these things that cost money and time that you didn't need to do. You, you only needed to do because you said, ah, it means I that number encode means that information. Yeah in my identifier, right? Yeah, but you, I could I could see where you couldn't make it. You know what? Well, just, it's, it's fine. Just leave it the way it is. But then you break the entire system. Bingo. Then you have another problem, which is now inconsistencies in, in this thing that you said is going to help me operate better. So now this idea of, well, we're much more efficient. We're faster. We have this sort of language that we use internally. Then your your shortcut language starts to turn into English where <laughs> everything exactly is exactly what I was just going right? to say. Then it's like, oh yeah, it's all of the time except for this, you know. Yeah. 
I before E except after C as in neighbor and what, you know, I mean, it's <laughs> this, this part is that except when this happens. And do you remember back when Bob did that? And oh, that part. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about that one on that job. It turned into, you know, and everything becomes a story and suddenly your shortcut isn't a shortcut anymore. So, so you're either, you really either need to be all in or all out. I mean, it, there's, there's no in between really. I think so. I mean, there are lots of people who are in between, but you know, you, you lose some of the benefits we're talking about. When you have these compromises, and I think these compromises always come up, you know, I, the number of times I've, I've had this conversation with customers and we talk through it, I mean, you always hear the exceptions and the things that come up and, oh, we ran out of digits for this. And so we had to expand that. And there's a story for everything. And you can never really anticipate the future. So are you always going to have thought of everything when you built up your intelligent system here? Right. I can imagine that given like, if you have, if, you have gone down the path of, okay, we're going to have an intelligent numbering system. We're going to encode all of this information. The more that you put into that, the more committed you are then, right? I mean, you're you're not going to want so. to give that up. Like, you've got so much time invested. Yeah, that's and right. So much time and so energy. Much information, yeah. You know, and, and you, yeah, you don't want to change. And I think that is part of what makes it almost like a religion to people is, um, especially for those who helped invent it, that's that's when it's really tough, right? Is if you are working with someone and talking about whether you keep it or you move away from it or you change it somehow and and you bump into the person who invented it at a company, <laughs> you know it immediately. Because <laughs> they're like, you know, hey, there is no way we're changing angry. this. <laughs> that's right. So it's, yeah. I understand that though, because, uh, you know, I I'll admit it. I've been involved in doing this. <laughs> I've done it myself, right? <laughs> there were there were things that I suggested back when I was working in engineering about, well, hey, you know, what if we did this? And what if we included this in the number? That would tell us this quickly and that would help me. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times it was uh, it was localized optimization, right? It was, let me make my job easier, my job quicker. And uh, once you realize that, you get some perspective on it. For me, it helped solve that one. That's not the only reason people do it, but... Well, you can imagine, based on my experience, where I came down on it, like, this is the dumbest thing ever. But but now, I mean, it, you know, I, I can certainly see the other side, so to speak. So. I did I, I did have a great conversation, though, with, uh, with, with one customer. I was having this debate with her, and we were talking through it, and she was very much on the side of, you know, I could change. It's, it's really not me. It's the rest of the organization that you've got to consider here. And I'm like, okay, I hear what you're saying. But in much the same way that, you know, but I'm convincing you. We it's it's an activity. It's an effort we have to do to convince other people. And she's like, hold on one second. We were standing in her office. She it dialed up somebody on the phone, put them on the speakerphone, and it was somebody I think in the shop or an in inventory control. And she, somebody very married to the idea. <laughs> she just said, "Well, I'm not even married to the idea. Just somebody very well versed in it." And yeah. she said, uh, "Hey, you know, so and so, can you tell me? Um, can you tell me what?" blah, 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 part is, and just rattle off this like 10 digit part number. And the person on the other phone is like, yeah, it's about that, 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 but I put it about that, that. Well, how about blah, 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 blah. And she did this for about four part numbers. And every one of them was just an instantaneous answer. This person was a walking database of, I can decode part numbers into what they mean. And, you know, her point was well made. People there had really optimized around knowing these numbering systems. And so I get it. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I get it. Well, and not just vested time and money and energy, but but also, right, that's, I don't want to say job security, but that was a value that they brought to the company. Oh, yeah. And that's a tough one you have to watch out for, right? If if you suggest changing something like this, that people invested time and energy in it, and that's a value that they bring. because that, And that's why she dialed up this person, right? Because they could instantly answer, right? right. And that was much faster than any... PDM or PLM lookup they were going to do. I can't argue with it. I mean, she was right. I used to be able to do that with phone numbers. But now that my cell phone holds them all, I can't. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell you a phone number out, to save my life. No, I have outsourced my memory as far as that goes. Actually, that's a great example now that you bring that up. <laughs> Think about that for a minute, right? The 800 numbers that we used to see on TV when we were mm -hmm. younger, and it was like, you know, 888 carpet. You know, you knew who to call. What did they do? They encoded some information in the number. Ah. That's a good point. That is a good point. So if if you're going to go down this path, you're going to say, okay, you know what? This makes a lot of sense to me. What are some of the things that you need to do to make sure that you're getting the value that you want out of it? 
Like what are what is or what are the some of the things not to do? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I mean, I think because there is a need to still do this. Um, you know, I, it, it's probably been clear through the way I've been talking about it. I, I have an opinion about this. I think you should try and avoid it. No, oh, really? Yeah, I know it's shocking. <laughs> I think you should try and use data management systems to help you out, not put intelligence in the numbers. But if you have to. I think there are some things you can do. I think, um, you know, one is there's a lot of guidance out there. I've searched about this on the internet quite a bit, and there's a lot of people giving advice on how to set up an intelligent uh, part numbering system. And that can really help you steer clear of problems, you know, running out of characters, or, you know, how do you maintain some flexibility to deal with things that are unexpected? I think another thing you have to really consider when you're setting up the system is avoiding ambiguity, because that's where... One of the challenges, I don't know that we even talked about this, is one of the challenges with getting a new part number is the friction that it introduces. You, you kind of touched on it when you're talking about how hard it was to get a new SKU. If you have to go through a series of steps and pick the information that's going to be encoded, well, sometimes there's a system to help you do that. Sometimes there's not, right? And if there's no system, I've seen plenty of these part numbering schemes where it's not clear. You go to pick, you know, the second three digits or whatever it might be. And you're like, well, I don't know if this is a blah or a blah. I'm not quite sure, right? Well, now that's a stop in your process. All you were trying to do is get a number and continue on with your design or whatever you were doing, but suddenly you had to stop and go consult somebody else and that kind of thing. So think about that, I think, when you're when you're setting up a system is make sure that there's no ambiguity, if you can make things mutually exclusive so it's kind of a clear decision tree. Oh, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this. If you can't systematize it, you know, that's going to be tough. It really should be. Right. That's kind of the it, whole it point, be. right? Um, to be able to systematize I think another it. thing um, to, to think about is if you're going to do it and you've got a data management system, right? So I hope most people today are thinking about data management um, and using digital tools. But if you're going to do that, remember that Certainly, certainly. Certainly the people listening to this podcast. Uh, remember that it's probably a customization. Now, that's something to consider if you've got a, a system uh, already in place and you're going to try and put intelligent part numbering in place. Well, that's kind of odd because you've already been using the system. But if you are, maybe it's got ways to, to let you do it without having to customize. But if you are going to have to write custom code that's unique, just remember that. You know, you're doing something to your system that nobody else has. It's very different from what everybody else does. That's one to consider and, and remember. Um, I think another thing that, that I think people should think about relates back to that process friction thing I mentioned a minute ago. And that is, who needs part numbers? Who gets them, right? I mean, if it's just folks internal who use your system where you're going to get them assigned and there's going to be clear rules and all those things, that's fine. But business changes, things are different. And at some point, will you need to outsource work? Will you ask a contractor to to do some design work for you and get a part number is another story I can remember is having to, to get blocks of part numbers for folks that we partnered with externally. Oh yeah. We contracted with them to do the chassis for this thing. Okay, great. I know the first time that that happened, it was a huge mess because they did the design work and they just gave everything, you know, numbers on their own. And they brought the design to us and all the CAD files and the bills material and all this stuff. And they're like, okay, here you go. We did our work. And we're like, these aren't our part numbers. How are we going to integrate this with the rest of what we were doing? Because we'd subcontracted them to do a piece of it. And so then there was this whole activity. I mean, it, it delayed the schedule by weeks where we had to go and renumber all their stuff. And we hadn't thought of it. All right, shame on us. Lots of people only make that mistake once. But it's another thing to consider is who is going to need to, to get a part number when you're thinking through the process. So make it accessible to all the people who need to use it um, and, and even understand it, right? That's making the numbers, but using them also. Well, that's, you bring up a, an inter interesting point as far as future. Like, things change, right? Companies change, like, what they make, what they outsource changes. So you almost have to think about, like, what are all of the potential people, not just the ones that need it now. What are the potential that's people? Right. Like, do we think we'll ever outsource this? If we, sh you know, if we should, then we need to consider that, leave a block of numbers for that. I mean, it's, how do you think about all of those things? That's the tough part. I don't have an answer for that one, right? Because, you know, how do you predict the future or plan the future? You do your best, right? You try and plan in the things that you can consider that might happen, but you can get wrapped up in that, right? And, oh, well, we've made a 
17-digit part number because we might need this, this, and this. All right, that's not a good answer either because you know what you were after was something usable and, and memorable and functional for today. And clear and concise and... Exactly. So that, that's the tough part. But I, I think you, know, you can do your best. You can say, well, there should be some category that we don't use today that's there and available to us. I mean, I'll give you an example. Back to that merger and acquisition thing we talked about earlier. You can't plan for that, right? But I've seen, this is the maybe one of the easiest answers I've seen to that problem. Two companies each had non-intelligent part numbers. So they were just sequences of numbers. They wanted to merge their two systems together. So, you know, they didn't have the same length of numbers, right? So one had th this many digits, you know, seven digits, and one had eight digits. How do we put those together? Okay, well, the company with the fewer number of digits got two digits added to their number, and they sort of jumped over the numbering of the other company, if that makes sense. So they had a way with, with non-intelligent numbers to make sure that they didn't end up with any conflicts. That's what they were after. And then they both had a way to carry forward. Okay, good. Well, that was, I mean, that was honestly a quick solution to what could have been a very complex problem. And I think that's, that's the kind of thing that you can try to think of, but with an intelligent numbering system, that's, that's very difficult. It's very difficult to figure that out. I feel like we've kind of talked around in a bit of a circle where at one point you had me 100% convinced intelligent part numbers were the way to go. Now I'm not so sure. Like, because of the, the not just the time invested in it, but how they seem to kind of lock you in. So it's hard to they do. harder to change. They do. And you, that's great. I'm glad I've sort of run you in a circle. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, I think that is good, though, because it's a complicated topic. I mean, I... I have an opinion, but I don't mean to say that one of these is, is wrong and one's right. It's not that. It's tricky. And it's, it's really important to think about what are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? And which one's the right fit for you? Because like I mentioned, externally facing part numbers, I get it. I get the value of that to people, to helping people easily remember things. So just, you know, that's maybe my, my biggest advice on the topic is think about what you're trying to accomplish and why, what tools and resources you have at your disposal and then, you know, choose the thing that, that seems the best fit. Oh, that makes sense. It makes sense. And I have to say that, you know, having doubted that this was going to be a very interesting conversation, you know, numbers just, I don't know. I've changed your mind? You have changed my mind. It was, it was a very <laughs> interesting conversation. And I bet our, our listeners would agree, particularly if everyone is as passionate about this as uh, you say that they are. So I would like to invite them to any of our listeners that are, you know, uh, listening to this podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Matter of fact, I think we had a, a specific challenge for this episode because it's a topic that people are passionate about. So if you've been listening to this, send us a note about your favorite part numbering story. Maybe it's a tough lesson someone learned or a funny story or, you know, tell us your passionate view on thing and why. But reach out. We are out here listening. We want a, this to be part of a conversation. So please. I would love to hear those stories. I, I mean, I've I've seen plenty of them firsthand, but I would love to hear more. So I do hope I do hope folks who are listening will take that challenge seriously and and send us some thoughts because I know there's some gems out there. Yeah, more than just mine and yours. So <laughs> let let us hear from you. You guys have been listening to us. Let us hear from you. And uh, thank you all for listening. Thanks, Jonathan, for convincing me that part numbers are an interesting topic. And uh, until next time, everybody, stay sharp. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to this episode of Stay Sharp with Razorleaf. We appreciate you. If you have any questions for our podcast team or have an idea for a new topic for our team to cover this year, please send an email to podcast at razorleaf.com. We would love to hear from you. Also, leave a comment on our post and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, stay sharp. <laughs>